One of the things I do in the morning when I get up after I have time of prayer and read the scripture is I check the news. I tend to be a news junkie. I, I like to know what's going on in the world I'm living in. And as soon as I opened up my news app, I was met with this headline. Maybe you saw it. Maybe you heard it this morning. Mass shooting in Alabama leaves four dead and at least 18 others wounded. No arrests made yet. And that's a heartbreaking headline. Heartbreaking because of the people who are hurt and killed. But even more heartbreaking is we see it all too often. Earlier this month, we had a 14-year-old shoot up a school. And how often does that happen now? Some years ago, there was a shooter on the UNCC campus. My daughter was in the building next to where he was at at one point. I understand the fear. This is the world that is going on now. Interestingly, it's nothing new under the sun, unfortunately. But it just seems like within the last couple of decades, it's become more prevalent here in this country. In our Sunday school class, as we were talking about the corruption of sin this morning, we were talking about the world in the days of Noah, how violent it was. Jesus says in the last times, the world will be as it was in the days of Noah. And I asked my Sunday school class, what, how does that fit today? What kind of violence happens today? And they began to share anecdotes and examples. Crime is up. It's not safe sometimes to go downtown anymore at night. Like others, I worry, like other men, I worry about my wife going to the grocery store by herself at night. I, 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 she doesn't do it. And then we look around at the different conflicts in the world, in Israel, in Ukraine, other places on the planet, wars heating up, conflicts heating up. And it's not just on that grand scale. Maybe before you left your house this morning, you had an argument with your spouse or with your kids or with your parents. Maybe there's trouble and, and drama at your job or at school. Again, nothing new under the sun. We live in a world of economic difficulty, racial disparity, division, 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 gender dysphoria. It's getting scary to just look at the news today for some people. And now we're in an election cycle and we're hoping that certain politician will fix it. Well, I've been around a, a while. I've lived through a lot of presidents. When I was born, John F. Kennedy was still president. That tells you how old I am. And I've seen Democrats come and I've seen Republicans come. And, and every one of them has promised to fix it. And the two candidates we have running now are promising to fix it. And I'm just going to tell you, they're not going to fix it. And the reason why is, technically, in and, and speaking of reality, they can't fix it. So if you're trusting in some form of government to make this world a better place, that's some kind of a delusion. Because governments have existed ever since the first family. And you know what happened with Cain and Abel. The problem is something that most people don't understand. As a matter of fact, when we talk about Democrats or Republicans, uh, conservatives or liberals, we like those labels, we throw them around, we shout at each other, we yell at each other. And I'm neither one of those political labels. I'm neither Republican or Democrat. 
Because the real issue goes much deeper, and, and, and technically it's much simpler than that. It's a dichotomy of philosophies that we do not want to address because it doesn't make us feel good. As a matter of fact, when I share this, a lot of people get offended. And the real divide in human culture, human politics, whatever you want to call it, is the fact that there is one group that believes that humanity is basically good. Humans are basically good people. That if you give them enough money and give them enough education, well, they'll create a utopian world. Charles Haddon Spurgeon commented on that almost 150 years ago. I don't have the exact quote, but he said something like, if you take a jewel thief and you give him all the money he needs and all the education you could give him, at the end of the day, all you'll have is a well-equipped, well-educated jewel thief. You see, there's one, one group that believes everyone's just basically good. That is one belief. Then there's the other belief that all humans are basically sinful. If you want to use neighborhood vernacular, they're basically bad or evil. And when I say that, I've had people offended at me. Well, you don't know my Aunt Gussie. She's a, one, she's a sweet lady. She was, she was born a saint and she's always going to be a saint. And I'm not going to argue about your Aunt Gussie. I bet she makes good biscuits too. <laughs> but that's the divide. And that's the philosophy that motivates people, motivates politicians, political parties. Which one is true? That all are sinful or that all are good? Well, biblically speaking... As we've seen the last couple of Sunday mornings in Sunday school, you know, if you're not going to Sunday school, you're missing stuff. Nine o'clock, you need to be there. We've got great teachers. But the Bible is very clear on what is going on with humanity. That's why I said in all of these catastrophes and criminalities, there's nothing new under the sun and in order to find the reason, we have to again go back to the Garden of Eden. So we're going to be back and we're going to see this morning how last week we talked about how when Adam and Eve were created, they recognized the center of the universe, God. They were given animation and authorization and they were given inspiration and aspiration from God. And they lived in paradise because God was their focus. And they were obedient to him and they, they enjoyed the providence of God, the, pers the presence of God. But God also gave them a limitation. One simple thing. One tree in the midst of thousands, many, many thousands, of which they could not eat. He said, don't eat it lest you die. Simple instructions. I mean, we live by that today. Don't jump off a cliff lest you die. Is that hard? Don't drink rat poison lest you die. That's not hard. Don't eat that fruit lest you die. One limitation in the midst of paradise. Oh, pastor, I would just forget that, would you? Come on. The problem, instead of recognizing their center, Adam and Eve rebelled against their center. All the luscious, beautiful fruit trees, vegetable plants, and that they were surrounded by, everything they needed to survive, well, they went to that limited area and they rebelled. Why can't politicians solve our problems? Why can't scientists solve our problems? Why can't academics solve our problems? Well, again, quoting Daniel F. Wells, author of The Courage to be Protestant, he says this, the problem is this. He says, we have replaced the actual center of life. And understand this, God is the actual center of life. He is life itself, and he is the giver of life. You're here today because God has given you life. 
We have replaced the actual center of life with one of our own making. Substituting our interest for God's. Our perspective for His. Our norms for His. Our meaning for His. And our privatized truths for His absolute truth. All of this is the essence of sin. Paul summed it up more succinctly under the inspiration of God in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, Paul says it this way. He says that we have exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. That is what our society struggles with. That is why no Republican and no Democrat is going to fix what is wrong until we as individuals fix what is wrong in our own lives. I submit to you that part of what is wrong is because the church hasn't heralded that message like it should. We sit in our buildings, huddled in our groups, singing the songs we like, hearing the sermons, doing nothing with them, having our little clutches, having our little parties. And we haven't been the church. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 3 where all the problems started. And again, you listen to the news and the Republicans are blaming the Democrats. The Democrats are blaming the Republicans. You go on Facebook and on Instagram and X, formerly Twitter. Do we still have to say that? And we have shouting between friends and shouting between neighbors and even brothers and sisters in Christ are hollering at each other. And even pastors are bullying people to vote for certain people. I have a pastor friend of mine who's gone on Facebook claiming who he's going to vote for and haranguing anybody that doesn't agree with him. I'm going to tell you something. This pastor is not doing that. I'm not going to go on and tell you, because number one, I'm not going to insult your intelligence. Number two, I'm not going to tie my star to any one man or woman. Nor am I going, as I said last week, am I going to hit like on your political post. If you put on there so-and-so is the wonderful so-and-so, I'm not, I'm not touching it. Because it's, neither one of these presidential candidates are going to save the day. Genesis chapter 3, as we jump into it this morning, we're going to see what happens. Let's read this passage. It says in verse, chapter 3, verse 1, now the serpent. When we left Adam and Eve, everything was great. They were cruising the garden, eating whatever they wanted to eat, enjoying their time together, doing as God wanted them to do, living life as God intended them to live, in peace, in harmony, in paradise, for heaven's sake. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. By the way, for those of you who love snakes, there it is. There it is. Oh, pastor, there are good snakes. No, there aren't. My wife got upset the other day because she accidentally ran over a squirrel. I mean, she came home crying. I thought, what happened? I hit a squirrel. I had to act like I thought that was bad. No, I... She felt bad. Now, I'm not an animal lover, unless it's on a plate or in a bucket, but I'm not an animal lover. If I were living single by myself, there would not be a cat within 50 yards of my house. But I also will not be cruel to animals. I try to avoid hitting squirrels and all the little woodland creatures that live around my home. But snakes, if I see a snake on the road, I'm going after him. (laughs) I'm not only going to run over him, but I'm going to back over him and make sure he's dead. And don't holler at me, that's a good snake. No, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. There you go. But let's read on. Which the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, the serpent talked. Sure. Again, this is, this, is, this is early history. This is the first creation or the creation of the world at first. And it was probably not anything new to Eve that an animal would speak to her. 
She, she probably didn't realize animals necessarily couldn't speak. But the serpent slithered up to Eve and he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Did God really say that? See, God told these things to Adam first. And then God created Eve from Adam's rib and they became a wonderful couple. And Adam conveyed the commands and the, and the stories to Eve. Then Satan slithered along and we see in this situation Satan's treachery. Satanic treachery. See, Satan had fallen from heaven, fallen from God at a time before the creation of humanity. The Bible tells us at one time Satan or Lucifer as he was called, which means uh, day star, light. Lucifer was created as a beautiful, gorgeous angel. The archangel, the chief angel. Ezekiel 28 seems to refer to Satan in typographical form. But Satan got full of himself and chose against God, chose to rebel against God. And God cast him out of his presence. And Satan wound up in the weeds and in the woods of earth as it was created. And as they say, misery loves company because Satan was cast out. Satan figured he'd have some friends join him. So he went to this newly minted couple of humans. And he went to Eve and he said, has God indeed said you shall not eat of the, every tree of the garden? Did God really say that? Did God really say that? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, verse 3, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now Eve seems to add on a parameter to this limitation. God simply told Adam, don't eat it. We don't have a record, and maybe he did. I'm not faulting Eve, but she said, don't eat it and don't even touch it. Maybe that was something added on later just to stay away from it. Don't even touch it. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Satan is sowing doubt. Satan is, is sowing discord. And we see her, her lie, her, and Satan telling the woman, listen, God lied to you. Did he really say that? Oh, she said, God said, if you eat it, you'll die. If you touch it, you'll die. You won't die. We see the first lie in Scripture. And it's coming from Satan, the serpentine devil. God lied to you. God lied to you. And so it goes on, verse 5, For God knows, eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Not only did he say God lied to you, but he's impl implying God is holding out on you. In other words, God gave his word. God spoke his word. And the devil came along and sowed doubt and treachery. He said, did God really say that? That goes on today. In the political sphere, in the academic sphere. Did, that, did God really create humanity? Did God really create the universe? Is Jesus the only way to heaven? This morning we talked about Noah and filling the ark. That story really true. How did all those animals get in the ark? Constantly, society is, is sowing doubtful questions. Sometimes implying and many times just come right out and saying, God lied to you. God lied. And see, God is holding back. If you enjoy the world the way the world was, was meant to be enjoyed, and that's from a pagan perspective, you will find so much fulfillment, so much love, so much joy if you'll just step away from that tyrant God. You know, you're, you're hung up in a marriage. There's so much love out there. You don't need one man. You don't need one woman. 
God made you a man, you don't have to be that. God made you a woman, you don't have to be that. Why, if you don't have what your neighbor has, you can't have a fulfilled life. Why are you so hung up at school? Go out and just live your life. I mean, all of these things, God's holding out on you. Why do you gather on Sunday morning? You could be out on the lake. You could be out in the woods. You could be on a trip. You could be at Disney World. You poor, pitiful, ackled human. By obeying God, you're missing out. Satan not only lied, but he sowed the seeds of what we call today FOMO. Fear of missing out. God, you know, God said the truth. God told him, don't eat of that tree. It's not hard. Why did God do that? He wanted to give them a choice. Choose to love and obey me or choose to love yourself and disobey me. It's not hard, but that's satanic treachery. Satanic used the, 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 the way of, of defeat by divide and conquer. Notice he didn't go to Adam and Eve together because they could have supported one another in reminding each other of the truth. So he went to Eve first. And he was slimy and he was slick. And he told her, God is holding out on you. So as we move on, it says in verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise... She took its fruit and ate. Oh, it was a beautiful piece of fruit. You know what they tell you when you're on a diet, you go through one of these diet groups or everything? Don't go to the grocery store when you're hungry. Have you ever done that? I have. That's the best time. It used to be the best time for me to go. It's probably why I'm in the condition I'm in today. Because when I go to the grocery store and I'm hungry, everything looks good. And I'm a little weird. I buy you unusual stuff. I remember one time they had blue ketchup. And I had to know what blue ketchup tasted like. So I bought blue ketchup. Then I walked by the produce section and they had cotton candy grapes. How do you? Yeah. Don't, yeah. I mean, it all looks good. But just because something looks good doesn't mean it is good. But it did look good, and it was pleasant to the eyes. It was good for food. Why, that looks like it would be tasty and nourishing. And God said, it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If I get it, I'll, I'll be wise. You know, that's how we make sinful decisions today. John, in, his, in 1 John, millennia after this, said, it's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's the, that's the anatomy of sin and sinful decisions. Satan knew that. And the Bible tells us that Eve was deceived in this, in this situation. And as we're going to see, there, this, this is the root of the seismic tragedy. Why do I call it the seismic tragedy? Because it's going to infect the entire world from that time till today. Eve was deceived. She bought into it. She believed a lie and she ate now, people oftentimes, especially mostly men, said, that, well, if it weren't for Eve, we'd still be sitting in the garden eating strawberries. I hate to tell you this, guys, but that's not true. Oh, but Pastor Mike, women are gullible. Well, let me tell you something, guys. We're gullible, too. I've been to the Bass Pro Outlet watching guys buy boats. I know men are gullible. Matter of fact, I submit to you, men oftentimes are more gullible than women. So don't get this chauvinistic, sexist viewpoint. If it weren't for Eve, everything would be all right. I even got caught up in that early in my ministry. I've told you this before. I preached a message on Eve called The Rib That Barbecued Man. <laughs> now, that is a clever title. Because at the time, I was young trying to be clever. I look back on that now with embarrassment. My apologies to every woman since Eve. Because here's the reality. Eve was deceived. And it's not because she was a woman, because men are easily deceived as well. But the difference here is, notice Eve was deceived. Look at what it says about Adam as we finish in verse 6. 
she also gave to her husband with her. Now, there was no serpent beguiling him or, 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 or fooling him. And it says, and he ate. Remember, Eve got the limitation news secondhand. Adam got it firsthand. Adam had no serpent schmoozing him and trying to get him. Adam knew what he did and he knew it was wrong, but he ate. So if you want to sit here and blame Eve, you better go to Romans chapter 5 where it says, for by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. Eve never gets the blame in Scripture. And contrary to popular Christian opinion, which is idiotic sometimes, God didn't make women second-class citizens. Don't forget, it was through a woman that God chose to bring his... Messiah. Don't forget that the first convert to Christianity in Europe was a woman. Don't forget it was the women who were the first one to the tomb while the apostles, the men, were hiding. The Bible says in Galatians 3.28, all are equal before God. Slaves and free, Jews and Gentiles, male and female. Eve was deceived, but Adam was deliberate. Of all the thousands of delicious fruit trees planted and cultivated by God and Adam and Eve that they could have eaten from, they chose the one. God said, don't eat it. And by that one seismic, tragic choice, they threw all of humanity into sin. That is why when you were born, you were born a sinner. You came out of your mother's womb sinful. You don't become a sinner when you sin. You, 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 you sin because you are a sinner. That's the reality of it. The reality is all humanity is born sinful, selfish, Evil and lost. All the money you can throw at humanity won't change that. All the education you can give humanity, unless it's education on Christ and the gospel, won't change that. See, this is the disparity in our culture. This is the disparity in the political philosophies. Again, you can call yourself conservative, you can call yourself liberal, you can call yourself Republican, you can call yourself Democrat. The reality is, is humanity born basically good or are people born basically evil? And as you see from Scripture, the second is the truth. We are born broken, we are born sinful. That's why it is a seismic tragedy because of the disobedience of the first couple. Eve was deceived. She was wrong, but she was deceived. But Adam, listen, especially men, listen to me. Adam sinned and rebelled against God, spat in his face with his eyes wide open. The shooting last night in Alabama... the near assassination of one of our presidential candidates, the assassinations of other presidents, the crime in our cities, the dysfunction of our families, the anger, the bitterness, the divide, the racism. You name it, this is where it started. Oh, I can't help it. It's because of Adam. No, no. You were born with that nature and it's on you and it's on me. It is a seismic tragedy because like a a seismic earthquake, it affects the whole earth. You will not understand human culture. You will not understand human nature. And you will be delusional in politics until you understand the nature and reality of the human experience. Paul said it again in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
It says later, there are none righteous, no, not one. So because of satanic treachery, Adam and Eve committed a seismic tragedy. And as we continue on, we see the results of that. And I want you to notice the selfish terror. Now, the Bible tells us that we should have the fear of God. And when the Bible tells us we should be fearful of God or have the fear of God, it means literally a reverential respect. That we respect God's majesty, God's power, God's greatness. When I was growing up, my dad was a wonderful, loving father, but my dad also, his word was law. And my dad dealt with us when we had issues. My dad was never abusive. My dad was never ugly. But my dad dealt with us and disciplined us when we were wrong. I had a healthy, reverential respect for my father. But I also knew my father loved me and cared for me, and I can go to him with anything I ever needed and felt protected by him as a child. And that's the kind of love and respect we should have for God. But I want you to notice this type of terror. Look at verse 7. Then after they ate of this fruit, the eyes of both of them were opened. Well, isn't that what we want? We want people to be open-minded and we want them to see everything. No, listen. And they knew that they were naked. Up until this point, Adam and Eve, when they were created living, they were created naked. And they didn't care. But all of a sudden they realized, oh my goodness, have you ever had that dream? How many of y'all ever had the dream that you were in school and you were naked in your classroom? Don't raise your hand. Because you know you have. You're either in school naked or at your job naked and you're freaking out and trying to figure out. And yes, because we don't want to be naked in public. Nor personally do I want to see other people naked in public. As a matter of fact, in the Middle East, it is a a sin and a shame to be naked in public. That was one of the ways they shamed Christ and and the malefactors on the crosses. They stripped them naked because it humiliated them. The eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and, or as we say in the South, naked, and they, were, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. They were now self-focused. See, before they were focused on God and they didn't care. It wasn't a big deal. But now they realized they were naked and they were self-conscious, self-focused. All of a sudden they knew there was a problem because instead of looking to God... They looked at their own navels. And see what happened? Their focus went from being on God as the center of their universe to themselves being the center. And they were self-conscious. We're naked. Oh my goodness. And it says they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And then it says in verse 8, and they heard the sounds of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool, on the, in the cool of the day. Some theologians tell us that this is Christ in his pre-incarnate, pre-flesh form. Maybe so. We're not going to get into that this morning. But somehow God's localized presence was walking through the garden. Because up until this time, they had unlimited fellowship in God's presence. What an amazing thing is that? It says, and Adam and his wife, what did they do? They ran out and had God, what happened? No, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the gardens. They were terrified of him because they were naked and mostly because they rebelled against him. Then the Lord God called to Adam and and said, where are you? Wait a minute, I thought God was um, omniscient. I thought he knew everything he does. He needed Adam, Adam to answer that question for himself. God knew where exactly where he was and what happened. Adam, where are you? So verse 10, So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God didn't care whether he was naked or not. God created, you know, we think nakedness is a dirty thing. You know what has made it dirty? Human perversion and self-consciousness. And and, and Adam was terrified because he was naked. He was more afraid for himself himself. If God was his focus, he wouldn't have cared. He was self-focused, self-conscious. And he hid himself. And then as we're going to see, he became selfish. Selfish. 
Say, kids aren't born sinful. Have you ever been around kids playing? They could be very selfish. That's my ball. His cake is bigger than mine. Her toy is newer than mine. And then over and over, that's mine. Selfish terror. We're afraid God is going to see something. And here's the thing, y'all. God sees everything. So the treachery of Satan created a seismic tragedy. And the result of this seismic tragedy was literally and basically human selfishness. Do you know why these seats are empty in our building this morning? Well, because some people are lazy. Some Christians are lazy. But some people are afraid of God. That's why they don't come to church. Because God will reveal something that they know it's there, but they don't want to see. Instead of fixing their gaze on him, they still look at their life. So let's continue to look at the results of the fall. Look what it says in verse 11. And he said, who told you that you were naked? All of a sudden you're naked? Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? God knew the answer to that, but he wanted them to see it. And instead of saying, God, mea culpa, my fault, I did it, I'm sorry, this was wrong, please forgive me. That would have been the right, that would have been the right response. But look what happened. Look at, this is the blame game. Right at the beginning, verse 12, then the man said, that woman, the woman you gave me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Can you hear that? God not only blames, I mean, Adam not only blames that woman, but he blames God. That woman, Lord, that you gave me, you gave her to me. I was doing fine by myself. No, he wasn't. He was lonely. But notice what's going on. Look at the tearing of society already. Adam blames Eve and God. Isn't that what we do today? We sin, we stumble, we struggle, and the first thing we do is we blame the other person. We get caught up in pornography, we blame our spouse. We cheat on our taxes, we blame the government. Do I need to continue? We're alcoholics because we blame our parents or our children. We blame life. We blame this. We, we're passing blame. Today, the Democrats are blaming the Republicans. The Republicans are blaming the Democrats. What Adam should have done and said, Lord, it was me and I'm sorry. In other words, Adam should have looked directly in the mirror and said, that's me. I'm the wrong one. We don't do that. Why? Because we're too self-focused. Passing the buck. So what did that woman that you gave me, God, what did she have to say? Verse 13. I ate of it too, Lord. I'm sorry. I was deceived. No, look what she said. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And Eve said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. That's the serpent's fault. He's, he's the one whose fault. Lord, I didn't do anything. Well, he deceived me. God's not buying that either. And then, and then I love this. So the Lord turned to the serpent. Do you see anything the serpent's saying? Because the serpent's looking around trying to find a gopher or a squirrel or an aardvark to blame. He couldn't. He just sat there and said, um. And so God began to mete out judgments to these people. And as he meets out the judgments, we're not going to get into it this morning, but it's the beginning of human struggle, struggling to live, dealing with pain, dealing with class. Even the serpent was judged to crawl on the earth. And the serpent today is still not a, not a very appreciate, not by me, animal. In other words, the, not only were human, was humanity judged, but nature itself was judged. We spoke about that in our Sunday school class this morning as well. When you see natural catastrophes occur, floods, earthquakes, fires, hurricanes... It all comes back to the decision of Adam and Eve. And we blame everyone else for everything else, even in our lives. Husbands today still point to that woman I have. And the wives say, it's that man I'm married to. 
My kids just make my life terrible. My parents are idiots. It's my boss's fault. It's my employee's fault. It's the government's fault. Can I tell you all something? If you're looking to government to be the answer to any problem in this life, you've got a pathology and a problem. Government is not God. Government is the problem, not the solution. We are governed because we lost our own personal government among God. So society began to tear. This is why we're struggling. This is why we're dealing with all the violence, all the hatred. And it's been going on ever since Adam and Eve. All the wars that humanity has endured, all the hatred, all the division, the murder, the cheating, the adultery, the broken homes, the broken hearts, the addictions, you name it, if it's bad, if it hurts, if it's uncomfortable, this is where it began and only God can fix it. C.S. Lewis said this about all of this stuff. He said, as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. What is pride? Pride is the original sin. Pride is looking at yourself. Pride is focusing on yourself. We talk about pride month every year. But not only is that lifestyle sinful, but pride itself. Because I hear people say, well, I have straight pride. Well, that's stupid too. Any kind of pride is wrong because pride is the reason we're where we are. Pride is look at me, look at myself, I'm proud. No, no. Adam and Eve demonstrated pride when they took their eyes off of God and decided I want to eat of that fruit and be good, be smart, be wise. I want to get what God's holding out on me. He lied. Pride. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on thing and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. C.S. Lewis was brilliant. As long as you are looking at your own life, your own navel, focused on your own wants, your own needs, your own ideas, your own opinions, you're not looking at God. You're not looking to God. That's why churches fuss and split. Because church members and groups of church members look at what they want and what they like and their preferences. That's why churches are becoming more ineffective today because we're so focused on our own self-therapy that we've forgotten that our job is to fulfill God's commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. So as you look at the culture today, I'm going to tell you this just straight out. You can get mad at me if you want. People have been there, done that before. Get in line with the rest of them. A Republican president's not going to fix this country. A Democratic president's not going to fix this country. Pastor, do you have your preferences? Yes. But just because I have my preferences, I know either whoever I vote for is not going to fix. I know that going in. What is going to fix this country? God's people surrendering to a living God and focusing on him again. You say, but you painted a bleak picture. Well, Paul in Romans chapter 5 gives us the answer as we finish this morning. He says, but the free gift, that's what salvation is. Salvation is a free gift. See, we're so sinful and, and rotted with sin, soaked with sin because of Adam, even what we try to do that's good gets sullied with our sinful imprints. That's why God himself had to descend from heaven. Jesus, God in the flesh, lived a perfect life. He's the only perfect human that ever existed. And then he was betrayed. He was, he was crucified on the cross. He was buried and three days later he rose again. And he offers salvation as a gift to all who would fall upon him in faith. But the free gift is not like the offense, Adam's offense. So here it is, for if by one man, don't worry, it's not Eve, for by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. See, that's the answer. 
He is the answer. We sang this morning in that beautiful song, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The answer to our country's ills is Jesus Christ. Well, how are people going to know about it? That's what we're here for. The answer to your personal ills. You might be dealing with drama, hatred, struggles, addictions. Yes, because of Adam, but also because of our choices with the nature of Adam. But the only way to deal with it is surrendering to Christ Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, I beg you to trust him. Abandon your hope to reach heaven by religion or reformation. Admit you're a sinner and fall upon him in faith. Trust him completely as your savior. He died for you when he was on the cross. He died for you. He was buried, but he rose again. He's alive and offers salvation to all who would accept. If you're a believer, let me ask you a question, my brother and sister in Christ. Are you focused on God in your life? Or are you still focused on yourself? That's it. That's the, that's the, that's the situation. Standing as we close in prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're here this morning and you never trusted Christ as Savior, yes, humanity's sinful. Humanity's broken. Humanity is lost. And if you're thinking you're going to be good enough, you can't. I can't. But you're a preacher. It doesn't matter. I've known many preachers that fall. And yet, but for the grace of God, go I. My salvation cannot, does not depend upon me. Many years ago, I came to Christ a broken sinner, undeserving of heaven, undeserving of anything. But I found that God loved me anyway. I heard that Christ died for me in spite of my sin and because of my sin. I heard that he became sin for me on the cross, took my sin on himself, and he paid the debt of death on my behalf and upon your behalf. He was buried and three days later he rose again from the dead and he said that all who would believe on him, that word believe means to trust and rely upon completely. All who would believe on him, not just believe in him, but believe on him would be saved and have everlasting life. That is the immediate answer to the problem of sin. And then as we receive Christ and as we begin to walk with him, we're still living in this sinful world and sinful bodies. We as believers, as Christians, need to continue to look to Him, to put Him at the center of our lives, and it's hard in this world. But if you're looking for government to make your life better, you're chasing a rabbit down a hole. I don't care what party you belong to. God is the answer. God is the answer to this country's ills. Listen, it would serve this country if the church of Jesus Christ would rise up in grace and courage and be what we say we are. Whoever wins the upcoming election, if the church would raise up and put Christ at the center and begin loving people to Christ again, we could bring revival and refreshment to this country. It's not going to come from the White House. It's going to come from this house. From your house. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. My prayer today is that everyone watching online, here in person, I pray that they would know Christ as their personal Savior. Father, I pray that they place their faith in Him once and for all to save them and, Lord, to to plant their feet. And, Father, I pray that everyone here who does know Christ, Lord, we would get our eyes off of ourselves, that we'd forget about our own opinions, that we would set apart our hearts for You. And that, Father, we would would subject our dreams to your dream for our life. Lord, we would set aside our visions and replace them with your vision. Father, that you would be our hope. That, Father, you would be the focus of all that we are and all that we want to be. That's the Savior and hope of our country and of our family and of us. Bless us now, Lord, as we depart. And may we truly be change agents in a world that has lost its focus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 